Did you know that it took over 2,000 years and influences from various cultures from all over the world to create this fascinating and delicious dish? And it took me well over a week to record this bloody video. I'm so inefficient. Hi, I'm Andre, and together we explore the history behind some classic fish dishes. Healthy, light, refreshing, sexy ceviche. Raw fish that is cured in citrus marinade. The acids denature the protein, technically cooking the fish. What sounds very straightforward took mankind millennia to bring to perfection. And yours truly, days to put on camera. The precursor to modern ceviche originated about 2,000 years ago, somewhere along the coast of what is now Peru, where raw fish would be marinated in the juices of a type of passion fruit. Sometimes people would even use chicha, an alcoholic beverage made from fermented corn. Because let's face it, even in the olden days, no cool story ever began with passion fruit juice alone. When the Spanish started bringing over various ingredients to the South American continent, they would introduce two things that would bring about fundamental change to this dish. Number one, lemons and limes, which are now most widely used for the curing process. And second, the name. Ceviche, according to many sources, derives its name from the Spanish escabeche, which in turn may have Arabic origins, where it is used to describe fish and meat dishes that are cooked in an acidic, vinegary sauce. Interesting, isn't it? But we are not done yet. At this point in time, people would still marinate the fish for long periods of time, essentially turning it texturally into, well, tough chicken? Enter the Japanese. In the late 1800s, Japanese people began emigrating to Peru and being the pescatorian overlords and omniscient regarding all things raw fish, they began significantly reducing the time used for curing. The result is modern day ceviche, where the natural freshness of the fish is preserved and the texture enhanced instead of chickenized. And finally, the world needed Peru trained chef Nobu Matsuhisa and Robert De Niro to spread ceviche across the globe through their Nobu restaurant empire. It is safe to say that ceviche's global success has indeed many fathers, but only one daddy. Today we are doing Arno Valam's interpretation of a Mediterranean style wild sea bass ceviche. The recipe can be found in his magnificent book, Poissonnerie. At this point in my videos, I generally share some fishy facts on the uh, poor bastard that I'm about to cook. However, in this episode, we've already dedicated quite a bit of time to the history of the dish itself. And with modern attention spans being perilously low, I'm risking that if only three more viewers lose interest in this video and change channels, I lose half my viewership. So let's keep today's fish facts short and sweet. Since ceviche is popular all around the globe, I think it's enough if I give you just a small overview of different fish species that can be used interchangeably for this recipe. Now, I'm willing to venture a semi-educated guess that in pre-Columbian Pacific South America, people would have used members of the so-called cyanidae family, also known as drums and croakers, for making ceviche, generally known as corvina in Spanish. Members of this fish family can be found all across the globe. Under names such as Mulloween, Red Drum, Croker, Umbrina, White Sea Bass, and Stone Bass. Don't think I skipped one. Interestingly, none of the aforementioned species are actually true sea bass. However, sea bass have arguably become one of the most favorite types of fish for ceviche. So if you like your sea bass from either side of the Atlantic, you're looking at temperate basses, the so-called Moronidae family. What? No. Why would they think that sounds funny? Does Moronidae sound fun? Oh, haha. Children. Anyway, some of the Moronidae members are Atlantic or European sea bass, striped bass, and white bass. That's enough fishy facts for today. This is a European or Atlantic sea bass. His name is Steve. Steve is one of the most prized fishes in Europe and goes by many names. Binominal name, 
Dyson Trucker's Labrex, French Lou de Mer or Bal, Italian Spigola or Branzino, Spanish Robalo or Lubina, Croatian Lubin or Branzin, Greek Labraki, and German Wolfsbach. For today's recipe, you shall need 600 grams of sea bass fillet. Again, get this filleted, pin boned, and skinned. For those keen on doing it themselves, I'm going to throw in a quick filleting session in a minute. You'll need also thyme, fellow bulb, two lemons, lime, 25 grams of softened butter. Now, this time I am following Arnold's recommendations on quantity, I'm not going to increase it. Fleur de sel, black pepper, and uh, Toast bread. Utensil wise, you'll need several bowls. I'm using three, but it's up to you to pick however many or however few you need. A sieve, an oven tray, a citrus juicer. Now I don't have one, so I'm using a plain old fork, a mandolin, a zester, a kitchen knife, and a flexi knife if you want to fill it. Okay, let's go. Same story as always. Place your fish with its belly towards you and cut from the nape of the head in an angle down. Flip, repeat the cut, snap the spine and pull out the entrails. Yes, this too is part of cooking and life. Cut open the belly and scrape out any remaining gut bits. Then slice open the membrane and uh, scratch out the bloody part, which is in fact the kidneys of the fish. Rinse and clean with kitchen roll. Cut right along the back using the spines of the spinal column as guide. You may notice that we did not descale the fish, and there is a very good reason for it, which I will reveal later. Keep the audience in suspense. Go around the vertebrae with your knife, then go back releasing the flesh by sliding the blade over the ribcage. One last cup, and there it is, your first fillet. Turn around what's left of Steve and repeat the same motion, this time starting from the tail. You may have to press a little harder to get through the scales. And no, that's not what Ariel said. Go around the vertebrae and the rib cage once more and release your second fillet. Lean as a whistle. Finish by trimming that belly fat. This unique filleting technique, by the way, is called the way of the flounder and is the secret style of fishmongers and mongerettes at the Finn and Flounder Fish Shop on London's Broadway Market. Stop by any time and watch us perform our magic. Remove the pin bones with fish tweezers, which in line with tradition, I forgot to mention in our utensils list. Those are sneaky bugs. Now to our great reveal as to why we left on the scales. It makes it a lot easier to skin the fish. And here's how you do it. Now it's time to pick the time. Add the softened butter, and by soft, I do mean soft. Otherwise, you'll have difficulties combining the two ingredients. Trim off the stalks and the bottom of the fennel bulb. Pick the so-called fronds and reserve for later use as garnish. Place the bulb on the mandolin and slice it into two to three millimeter thick well, slices. Zest one lemon and the lime and keep the result for garnishing. Remove pips and squeeze one lemon into the sliced fennel and let marinate for at least 10 minutes. This softens the texture and flavor of the fennel and adds a lovely freshness. Drain and keep the lemon juice. All right. For those of you who haven't fallen asleep yet, crouton time. Butter the slices of toast on both sides and sprinkle with fleur de sel. Pop it all in the oven, which should be now set to grill mode at 220 degrees centigrade and place on the top rack. Keep a watchful eye as the toast may burn quickly. Once crunchy, flip and repeat. Remove the edges and lovingly cut the tranches into cute little croutons. Now here's a pro tip. Place on a tray lined with kitchen roll and keep warm on the bottom rack of the now switched off oven until when you need them. 
This is going to keep them even crunchier. Back to Steve. Separate the fillet into so-called he fillet, which is the top loin, and the she fillet, which is the belly side. Cut the fish into 5mm thick slices, pretty much as one would for sashimi. Cut the second lemon and the lime and squeeze out the juice into the bowl with the juice from marinating the fennel. But this time, using the bloody sieve that has been laying around readily all this time. <sighs> anyway, add the Latino sashimi, mix well and let it cure for about 15 minutes. The citric acids have now denatured our fish, making the flesh appear cooked. Use our beloved sieve and drain well. Now it's time to assemble and season our ceviche. Sprinkle some fleur de sel to taste. Add pepper. And mix in the thyme butter. All right. I'll now let you finish watching how to dress the plate in peace while I go get some well-deserved coffee. All this narrating is making me want for caffeine. See you in a bit. I have to be honest, one of the things I like most about cold dishes is that uh, they're still perfectly presentable once you're done taking money shots and all that filming creator nonsense. Speaking of creator nonsense, if you like this video, I would really appreciate it if you hit that subscribe button and give me a like. Uh, also, check out my last week's video where I cook the mother of all television dinners. Juicy brill fillets with mussels on papillon. Yep. That's aluminium wrap baked fish. Mwah. All right, let's try it. Oh, you know, cooking is all about establishing relationships, which I'm going to do now. Hold on. That's what I call crunch. Love it or hate it, the croutons are perfect. Um, yeah, the fish is not too shabby yet. Hmm. I hope you enjoyed this, and um, until next time, cheerio. Mm -hmm.